there have been some really beautiful presentations this morning, so I decided to go the sort of antithetical route and use Vim for my uh, presentation materials. Um, but it gets the job done. I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm going to talk really, really quickly. So ask me questions on Twitter and come and find me later. Um, essentially, I'm a, a kind of lead guy. I, I'm uh, currently leading a team of about 15 people, split across four teams at Wonga. And we've been using Angular on and off for about 18 months, two years. So the history here is that uh, I worked on an Angular project for about a year. Um, we've been shoehorning uh, Angular. So that was a sort of Greenfield's project, a mobile app. Since then, we've been sort of shoehorning bits of Angular into, on top of a PHP application. But actually, before that, I did a backbone application. Um, so. I'm going to talk about why you should care about Angular and sort of looking at it from the lead developer's perspective. So um, as an individual contributor, if you've, if you've come across Angular, you've probably gone, this is actually really cool. So I'm actually not going to delve into the detail of that much about what Angular is or what it does. Suffice to say that it's a pretty full stack framework for JavaScript development. So why would you care about it? So one of the things that I really like about it is that it's batches included. If you've come across Django or Rails or Symfony or any of those back-end frameworks, it's great to have a whole toolkit of bits and pieces that you can use. So Angular ships with a router. It ships with a bunch of testing frameworks. It ships with a like, nice way of mocking some of the browser core objects so you can test services really easily. And it gives you some of the patterns. So when you're working on an Angular project, uh, I can come along and you look at your Angular project and go, oh, yeah, you've got a bunch of controllers, a bunch of services, a bunch of directives to do UI components. I feel like I'm at home here. And um, I learned that uh, doing Django development, I had that same experience. And I then moved on to a Python project where somebody built their own framework. And I was like, this is a catastrophe. I can't work on this project in any way. So it's really nice to have that familiarity. And you'll see discussions on the internet of, uh, actually, do you know what? We lay our Angular projects out like this, and while we do ours like that, and they're you know, basically sort of horse trading over minor details. When it comes down to it, you're putting code in sort of similar kind of structures. So a, a nice sort of uh, knock-on effect of that is you can create reusable components really easily. So uh, directives are essentially little view components. We've built a little slider and outsourced, open sourced it because we looked at the, kind of the other sliders out there and we didn't like that one, that, the ones that were out there. So we built our own one and now anyone can use that. We can reuse it in projects really easily. Um, you can also do that with services, which is essentially the way of capturing business logic, so a little bit like models. Um, if, uh, so we're working on a mobile app. One of the things we wanted to do was start to reuse some of the code in a desktop app. We uh, created templates and controllers which were specific to the mobile app. But we had services that contained logic which we got to reuse across the two different places. So then we could kind of mix and match a little bit and reuse across the two, which was really cool. Um, there's also a huge community. So there's a site called ngmodules.org, or I can't remember whether it's .com or .org, um, which has uh, a huge library of a lot of the really common stuff. So again, it's a similar way of working that you might have experienced in some of the back-end frameworks. You're like, how do I do file uploads in a really nice way with Angular? Google it. There's somebody who's already solved that problem. And if, you, if their module doesn't fit your need, then you can go and pick, it, pick up uh, the source code and, and tweak it. Um, testability. One of the things that I really s sort of uh, felt strongly about when I was in uh, working in Backbone was that I can test everything really well because it's just plain JavaScript. You know, there's 200 lines of code or whatever in the Backbone source. I can go and read it. I can understand pretty much all of it. And if I want to then test some of it, it's just plain JavaScript. So I can use whatever test framework I like. And I looked at Angular and I was like, there's a lot of dollar signs. First of all, you will wear out the dollar sign key on your ke keyboard. Um, but secondarily, it's like this is this is all really kind of magical. Um, how how am I going to test this? And the, and the answer is they actually have a really good uh, set of test tools. So you don't need to know too much about the internals. Uh, there, there is some magic under the hood. But the key thing is you can test your controllers, you can test your services, you can test your directives, how they're doing DOM updates, how they're kind of providing dynamic interaction, the whole picture. Um, at you, you, to slightly extent, I'm going to have to ask you to trust me a little bit on that. But when you get into it, you'll find that testing has is, is got a really good story. Um, I mentioned that I'd worked on a mobile app where we were kind of green fields. We were like just tearing away, writing Angular with one HTML document, and that was it. It was just a bootstrap. Um, since then, I've been adding Angular to an existing application. This is one of Angular's other huge strengths in my mind, is that you can be really ad hoc about how you uh, move into an existing project. So um, to give you an example, we had a little field where people would enter their salary. And we had some confusion between our customers, whether it was monthly or annually, despite the fact it said very clearly. So we built a little Angular calculator, which would calculate the annual salary. So you typed in, my monthly salary is a million pounds. It would say, 
Maybe that means you have an annual salary of £12 million. Good for you. Um, that calculator was really easy to drop in and uh, was something that we were able to roll out in just a week. You know, it, was, it was very quick to get that to production. Um, essentially, you can just drop the Angular JS into any PHP or HTML or whatever and uh, then start using it. So, and, and Angular lets you kind of say, this is the scope of my application, this entire page, or this little bit down here. So you can kind of be really ad hoc about it. And you can also reuse different services across different pages if you want to. Um, Ionic, something you should be aware of, is a, a set of tools uh, on top of Angular for making Angular and PhoneGap play nicely together and gives you some, I think it gives you some CSS bits as well. Um, when I began my mobile project, Ionic didn't really exist yet, which is, sucks because I had to reinvent a whole lot of stuff that they've done a better job of in Ionic. Um, it gives you a set of tools for really quickly building great mobile experiences and it's the kind of toolkit where you can go to, people, go to your developers, look, you're going to write code like this, and they go, that's great. And you go to the managers and you go, this is the product we're going to deliver, and they go, that's great. And it just, it just is magical in that sense. Um, we are hiring at the moment, and one of the things I'm starting to see on CVs uh, is Angular just all over the place, like a virus taking over. And I'm not talking about front-end developers, I'm talking about back-end developers. So we have so PHP and we have .NET on the back-end, and we're looking for .NET candidates, and more and more and more of them are coming up and saying, actually, our Angular is one of the things I really want to work on. That developer love gives me two really nice properties. One, I've got the motivation from the guys who are working on code and saying, yeah, I really want to work on this. This is really great. I'm actually, I'm, you know, I'm coming to work, I'm staying to work. I'm, uh, my engagement level is really high. And that, uh, above all, you know, all, all the technical stuff about Angular is kind of secondary to the fact that if people enjoy working on it, they're going to get so much more done. Um, Patrick, so the slide where he was talking about consistency versus improvement, and Angular was one of the things where we made a sort of strategic decision to say, well, this looks really cool, people really like it, let's invest in our team, and let's, let's try this out and in little piecemeal ways. And it's worked for us really nicely. And when I say the back-end guys are really interested in it too, what that means is that for the first time, I actually have back-end guys coming and saying to me, well, can I do some, can I work on this front-end project for a bit? You know, I'm in this feature team with this front-end people, maybe it would be cool to do some of that Angular stuff. And I'm like, Really? I've never had this from back end people before. Um, full stack people, amazing, but it's sort of like real, so we're in financial services, real financial services people doing front end stuff is a really cool thing. Um, I have no idea where I am on time, but I sense I'm running out. I'm only halfway through. Wow, my God. <laughs> um, that is a really fast ramble. <laughs> Does anyone get any of it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing, the, the major caveat I, hear, I have here is that uh, Angular 2 uh, is confusing and terrifying to me as an Angular dev with two years' experience. Um, so I saw somebody uh, saying on their blog this week that they were converting a lot of their Angular 1 code to Angular 2. And I was just like, I have no idea why you would do that. So it, they've changed programming language that they're using for the project uh, at least once, and I think possibly twice. Um, Angular 2 is still really, really alpha. Uh, it's a really interesting example of how a project can dynamically evolve in the very public sphere. I'm very mindful of Perl 6, which never saw the light of day, but was going to be amazing. Um, Angular 2, I think, is probably going to be better. One of the reasons for that is that they've sort of said, actually, uh, one of the flaws of Angular 1 is it is a little bit too full stack. It's kind of a maturity model. So uh, again, I'm going to draw a parallel with Django in the Python world. When, when Django initially launched, there was really kind of a bit of disarray in the Python web framework world. And Django really unified uh, a lot of kind of the basic concepts that you want in a framework. And a lot of people got on board with it and said, actually, this just gets the job done in nine out of 10 cases. But as time went by and as the tooling improved in the Python community, Django's kind of raison d'etre became less, less of a sort of powerful argument, essentially. And things like microframeworks did a better job of mapping HTTP, and people understood better how to separate their code. And generally, it was um, the, the framework model sort of it's, over time becomes more constraining than it is enabling. And I feel like that sort of is something of a risk with Angular. It's, it's very possible to say, we're going to write all our services as Angular services, and then think, well, how are we going to reuse them in a non-Angular context? Like, what if we do, at some point, want to move away from Angular? How are we going to deal with that? So I think Angular 2, over the longer term, will deliver that sort of a bit more plain JavaScript-ness and a little bit less it's all or nothing Angular. Um, at the moment, I think it would be a difficult proposition to sort of argue for. But hey, it's fun. So, you know, try it. And I'm going to stop there.
So I'm going to hand over to James. He is. Thank you.